good afternoon and welcome to the World News Review on Independent Television Abuja. I am Ikiru Obuli. Starting off, the toll continued to rise from the earthquake that devastated the Indonesian island of Sulawesi with worries that it could worsen. Luato in Yusuf has the details of this and other stories on the foreign scene. The National Disaster Agency says at least 832 people were killed in the devastating earthquake and tsunami that hit the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Many people were reported trapped in the rubble of buildings that collapsed in Friday's 7.5 magnitude earthquake. Agency spokesman Sutopu Powo told news conference. The quake triggered tsunami waves as high as 6 meters 20 feet high. He added. Vice President Jasuf Kala said the final death toll could be thousands. Rescuers have been digging by hand in the search for survivors in the city of Palu. There have also been concerns about the town of Dongala where the impact is still unclear. The Red Cross estimates that more than 1.6 million people have been affected by the earthquake and tsunami which is described as a tragedy that could get much worse. Meanwhile, a South Korean lawmaker has said the number of North Korean defectors to South Korea has fallen since Kim Jong-un came to power seven years ago. Park Bo young sung citing data from the South Unification Ministry, said there had been 1,127 defections last year compared with 2,706 in 2011. Mr. Park said tighter border controls between North Korea and China and higher rates charged by people smugglers were key factors. Pyongyang has made no public comment. The vast majority of defectors from the North are eventually offered South Korean citizenship. So as says more than 30,000 North Koreans have crossed the border since the end of the Korean War in 1953. Most flee via China, which has the longest border with North Korea and is easier to cross than the heavily protected militarized zone between the two Koreas. China regards the defectors as illegal migrants rather than refugees and often forcibly repatriates them. Relations between the North and the South, who are still technically at war, have improved in recent months. Earlier this month, the leaders of the two countries met in Pyongyang for talks that centered on the stalled denuclearization negotiations. This came after June's historic meeting between U.S. President Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un in Singapore when they agreed in broad terms to work towards the nuclear-free Korean Peninsula. On Saturday, North Korean Foreign Minister Ri yong hoo blamed U.S. sanctions for the lack of progress. The courts have started voting in Kurdish parliamentary elections a year after the semi-autonomous regions failed due to independence from Iraq. Sunday's election will see hundreds of candidates vying for 111 seats in the regional parliament, including five cities located for Turkmen, five seats for Christians, and one seat for Armenians. More than 3.1 people are eligible to vote in the semi-autonomous region. With opposition parties weak, the Kurdistan Democratic Party and Patriotic Union of Kurdistan are likely to extend their almost three decades of sharing power. Prime Minister Nacharvan Brazani of the Kurdistan Democratic Party cast his vote shortly after polls opened on Sunday morning. Elections had been scheduled for late 2017 but were deferred in the aftermath of a referendum for independence which was met by a swift backlash from Baghdad. With 92% of Iraqi courts voting in favor of independence, Iraq issued a strong response imposing economic penalties and taking over oil producing city of Kirkuk. Most major parties say they do not expect more than about 40% of the 3.85 million registered voters to go to the polls, below even the record low of 44.5% who voted in the federal election. Indonesia continued to be in the news following the devastating earthquake and tsunami that hit AIDS island of Sulawesi with fears that the death tolls could rise into thousands. Catherine AMSL has more on the foreign scene. Friday's disaster devastated swatches of eastern Sulawesi Island and had left at least 844 people dead too. Some remote areas have yet to be contacted and there are fears that the death toll could rise further. 
A lack of heavy lifting equipment is hampering rescuers' attempt to reach people who remain alive in the ruins of collapsed building. Dozens of people are feared to be underneath the rubble of one hotel alone, the Roa Roa in the devastated resort of Palu. In Sigi, south of Palu, the bodies of 34 children were found at a church which was engulfed in mud and debris. Indonesian Red Cross spokeswoman Aulia Ariani was quoted as saying that children were on a Bible camp. Officials say troops from North and South Korea have started removing some of the more than 800,000 landmines buried along their borders. In the South, clearing has started at the heavily fortified joint security area in the village of Pamunjung. Mines will also be removed from a separate site where hundreds of soldiers were killed in Korean War. The move was agreed when the leaders of the two Koreas, Kim Jong-un and Moon Jong-in, met last month in Pyongyang. South Korea's defense ministry said in a statement on Monday, all landmines in the JSA, which is the only portion of the dynamic which is the only portion of the demilitarized zones where forces stand face to face are expected to be removed by military personnel within the next 20 days. United States First Lady Melania Trump arrived Ghana in a solo trip which will focus on promoting health care and education programs run by the United States aid organization, USAID. Gabriel Kuma has more news on the point. U.S. First Lady Melania Trump has arrived in Ghana's capital, Accra, on a solo trip that will see her visit four African countries. The tour will focus on promoting health care and education programs run by the U.S. aid organization, USAID. She will also visit Kenya, Malawi, and Egypt to foster diplomatic relations. In February, a row broke out after President Donald Trump allegedly used the word shithole to describe African nations. Mrs. Trump's week-long trip to the continent is seen as helping to heal some of the divisions. She will also promote her best initiative, which aims to tackle issues such as cyberbullying and boost healthy living. A suicide attacker has killed 13 people and injured more than 30 at an election rally in Nagaha province, the first major attack on campaigning since it began last Friday. Supporters of parliamentary candidate Abdel Nasser Mohamed had gathered in Kama district when the blast happened. The parliamentary election will be held on 20 October and there have been threats of violence. Both the Taliban and the Islamic State group have urged a boycott of the vote. Provincial Governor Atola Kongani told newsmen that Mr. Momar had survived the attack but did not say if he was injured. The force of the blast reportedly caused the ceiling to collapse on the crowd of about 250 people. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the attack. The World Health Organization said it was helping Yemeni authorities with a second round of vaccination against cholera in three hard-hit districts as cases surged across the war-ravaged country. More than 2,500 people have died of the waterborne infection since the worst cholera outbreak in Yemen's history began in April 2017, while nearly 1 million more suspected cases have been reported across the country. Children under the age of five make up nearly a third of all suspected cases. During the first eight months of the year, Yemen registered nearly 155,000 suspected cholera cases, including 197 deaths. According to WHO, in the last week of August alone, 9,425 suspected cholera cases were recorded across the country, and just a week later, the number of suspected cases recorded soared to 11,478. We'll go on a sharp break now when we return. The World News Review continues. Please stay with us. It's another Christmas season again. ITV Abuja is bringing Father Christmas to your doorstep with lots and lots of goodies and gifts this season for 1,000 naira only per child. Schools, churches and other interested organizations who want our Father Christmas to visit them should visit our communication complex in Pape Hills, Abuja. 
or call 0706-715-7865, 0806-622-6093 or 0807-833-3584. Children, children, don't miss out and be part of this excitement. You're welcome back and if you're just joining us, this is the World News Review on Independent Television Abuja. To add the reports, Russia completed the delivery of S-300 surface to air missile system to the Syrian military as part of new security measures following the downing of a Russian plane last month. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu on Tuesday said at a meeting of the country's Security Council that its army had finished the deliveries of S-300 systems, including a total of four launch platforms. Shogu said it will take three months to train the Syrian military to operate the new air defense system, while the integration of Russian and Syrian air defense assets into a single automated system will be completed by October the 20th. Russia, a key ally of the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad, joined the seven-year war in 2015. Time was running out Wednesday for anyone trapped in the debris of a devastating earthquake and tsunami in Indonesia five days after a disaster struck. According to the country's disaster management agency, the death toll on the island of Sulawesi climbed to 1,000. 347 as rescue teams scramble to locate survivors. Authorities and aid workers struggle to reach the affected areas made inaccessible by damaged infrastructure. Palo, a small city about 1,500 kilometers northeast of the capital, Jakarta, and other parts of Sulawesi Island were the hardest hit by Friday's magnitude 7.5 quake that triggered six meters high tsunami waves. Outside Palo's Mitiara Al Jufri Airport, hundreds of others were camped out and some receiving medical treatment while others were waiting a chance to escape. President Donald Trump mocked the testimony of Christian Bosey Ford against his Supreme Court's nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, at a rally in Mississippi. Days earlier, he had said Professor Ford was a credible and compelling witness. Professor Ford told a Senate committee that Mr. Kavanaugh assaulted her as a teenager, an allegation he denies. Mr. Trump ordered the FBI to investigate the claim following the Senate testimony. However, Professor Ford's lawyer said that the FBI has not yet spoken to her and said it was inconceivable that the agency could carry out a thorough investigation without interviewing her. The FBI investigation was due to be completed Friday. And U.S. First Lady Melania Trump has visited a former slave fort in Ghana on the second day of a solo trip to Africa. She said the dungeon is really something that people should see and experience and that what happened so many years ago was really a tragedy. People were kept naked and chained in the 17th century Cape Coast Castle waiting to be shipped as slaves. Mrs. Trump's African tour will include Kenya, Malawi and Egypt and is intended to promote children's welfare. President Donald Trump has not visited Africa since taking office in January of 2017. In February, a row broke out after he allegedly used shithole to describe some African nations. Mrs. Trump's week-long visit to the continent is seen as helping to heal some of the divisions. The highlight on Wednesday was her tour of Cape Coast Castle, a major outpost on the Atlantic slave trading route. She first paid a courtesy visit to a local traditional ruler, Osabarim Berkwesi II, meeting him in Obama Hall, named after former U.S. President Barack Obama. Mr. Obama, the first African-American president, visited the castle in 2009 with his wife Michelle, a descendant of African slaves and their two daughters. France has blamed the Iran's Ministry of Intelligence for plotting a bomb attack on an exiled opposition group's rally outside the capital of Paris in June. A joint statement by France's interior economy and foreign minister said the freezing of assets belonging to Tehran's intelligence services and two Iranian nationals on Tuesday was linked to the alleged attempt to bomb the People's Mujahideen of Iran-Mek rally. 
The French ministers called the six-month freeze on the asset preventative, targeted and proportionate. The hardening of relations between Paris and Tehran could have far-reaching consequences for Iran as President Hassan Rouhani's government looks to European capitals to salvage a 2015 nuclear deal after the United States pulled out and reimposed tough sanctions on the country. Police sources said Royden Fade, a French gangster who broke out of jail using a hijacked helicopter in July, has been recaptured. The country's most wanted fugitive was detained north of Paris, reportedly by his brother and two men. Fade, 46, is a fan of gangster films which he credits were teaching him how to pull off raids. He was first arrested in 1998 for armed robbery. The first July jailbreak was the second and most dramatic escape. He was sprung from a prison in rural southeast of Paris by three heavily armed men who broke into the visitor's room. They then bundled him into a helicopter flown by a flying instructor who had been taken hostage. He was recaptured in the early hours on Wednesday in the town of Creel. Iran's new president, Baram Saleh, has named veteran Shia Islamic politician Adel Abdul Mahdi as prime minister designate, ending months of deadlock. Mr. Saleh, a Kurdish former deputy prime minister, was elected to a largely ceremonial post by MPs late on Tuesday. Soon afterwards, he asked Mr. Abdul Mahdi, who served as vice president and oil ministers, to form a government. The French educated economist is the nominee of the two Shia led bloc that won the most seats of May's elections. He will have to oversee the reconstruction of Iraq following the four year battle against jihadist group Islamic State, IS, which left tens of thousands of homes and businesses destroyed and displaced more than three million people. Canada's parliament formally stripped and sent Suu Kyi of her honorary Canadian citizenship for complicity in the atrocities committed against Myanmar's Rohingyas. And Sun Suu Kyi became the first person to have her honorary Canadian citizenship revoked on Tuesday. The Senate voted unanimously to strip and send Suu Kyi, Myanmar's civilian leader of the symbolic honor bestowed on her in 2007. The upper houses move follows a similar unanimous vote in the House of Commons last week. A United Nations fact-finding mission reported last month's Myanmar military has systematically killed thousands of Rohingya civilians, burned hundreds of their villages, and engaged in ethnic cleansing and mass gang rape. And Prime Minister Theresa May has called on her Conservative Party to pull together and unite behind her plan to leave the European Union. On Wednesday, the final day of her party's conference, May rallied members trying to address their concerns that the Conservatives are becoming increasingly directionless under the weight of Brexit by calling on them to look to a brighter future. Dancing onto the stage in the city of Birmingham to a vast dancing queen to a standing ovation, May poked fun at herself after her dance moves were mocked in on, on a trip to Africa and after last year's conference where her speech was disrupted by a coughing fit, a state intruder and a disintegrating stage. United States President Donald Trump faced fierce criticism after he mocked Christian Balsy Ford the accuser of his Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, at a rally in Mississippi. Let's join Charity Tanko for more news on the foreign scene. U.S. President Donald Trump is facing criticism from fellow Republicans after he mocked a woman who says she was assaulted by his Supreme Court nominee. Senators Jeff Fleck and Susan Collins, both key votes to confirm Brett Kavanaugh, spoke out a day after Mr. Trump's remarks at a Mississippi rally. Mr. Fleck called the president's comment appalling, and Mrs. Collins said they were just plain wrong. Last week, Mr. Trump called Christian Blasey Ford a compelling witness. Mr. Fleck of Arizona is a closely watched swing vote, as Republicans can potentially only afford one defection. If confirmed, Judge Kavanaugh, 53, will be expected to tilt the ideological balance of the Supreme Court in favor of conservatives. 
Its nine justices are appointed for life and have the final say on some of the most contentious issues in U.S. public life, from abortion to gun control to voting laws. The International Court of Justice, ICJ, has ordered the U.S. to ease sanctions it reimposed on Iran after pulling out a nuclear deal last year. Siding with Tehran, it said exports of humanitarian goods such as food and medicines should be allowed. The U.S. argued the court had no jurisdiction in the case as it concerned its national security. The rulings of the ICJ, which is based in The Hague, are binding, but the court has no power to enforce them. It is the main judicial organ of the UN and settles legal disputes between member states. But both nations have in the past ignored the court's rulings. Announcing the decision on Wednesday, the court's president, George Abdul Kawi Yusuf, said the court considers that the United States must remove by means of its choosing any impediment to the free exportation to the territory of Iran of goods required for humanitarian needs. Six rescue divers drowned while trying to rescue a teenager from a disused mining pool in Malaysia, just as officials say Dutch security services expelled four Russians over a cyber attack plot targeting the global chemical weapons watchdog. Oluwatoin Yusuf has more on the foreign scene. Six rescue divers have drowned while trying to save a teenager from a disused mining pool in Malaysia. They were searching for a 17-year-old boy who is thought to have fallen into the body of the water while fishing with his friends on Wednesday. Authorities say the divers became caught in a well pool and sudden strong currents caused some of their equipment to come off. The search for the missing boy resumed on Thursday. According to Sepang District Police Chief Abdul Azizi Ali, the divers followed all safety procedures as they went into the pool on a search and rescue mission. The men were in the water for about 30 minutes while their colleagues tried to rescue them. All six were unconscious when they were pulled out of the water and could not be resuscitated. Meanwhile, U.S. Senators are assessing an FBI report into sexual misconduct allegations against Brett Kavanaugh, President Donald Trump's Supreme Court nominee. It is not clear what the report contains. It will not be made public. The judge has vehemently denied all allegations against him. Republicans and Democrats are divided over the nomination. A confirmation vote is expected to be held on Saturday. His appointment will tilt the court in favor of conservatives. The court's nine justices are appointed for life and have the final say on some of the most contentious issues in U.S. public life from abortion to gun control and voting law. Officials say Dutch security services expelled four Russians over a cyber attack plot targeting the global chemical weapon watchdog. The operations by Russia GRU military intelligence allegedly targeted the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons in the Hague in April. The OPCW has been probing a chemical attack on a Russian ex-spy in the UK. The allegations are part of an organized pushback against alleged Russian cyber attacks around the world. Reports also say the Netherlands has summoned the Russian ambassador for an explanation. Dutch Defense Minister Ank Bijleveld Sauten said the cyber oppression against the OPCW is unacceptable by revealing the Russian action, adding that a clear message has been sent to Russia for them to stop. And that's the size of our package on the World News Review. Many thanks for staying with us. I'm Kiro Ubuli. Do enjoy the rest of the day.